Hey guys, welcome back. So today I brought home this 5700 watt rigid generator. It is powered by a Yamaha MZ300 engine. And for the most part, this thing looks pretty complete. Now I did notice there is a lot of dust, you know, on top of the engine, which usually isn't a big concern, but I can tell this air box has been jerry-rigged and the filter inside is definitely not the proper one. So I hope this engine hasn't ingested too much dirt, but you know, the engine does turn over, it has compression. So I think it has a lot of potential to run. Now, unfortunately, I don't know the history on this machine. You know, this was thrown away at the dump and probably for good reason. So I do wanna get the engine running, make sure it sounds good. But before I do that, there is another red flag, which has me concerned. The 240 volt outlet is missing. So I don't know if that just fell in or, you know, if there's loose wires in there. So I want to check that out. Obviously, I'll check the oil and I'm probably going to pull the cap off the power head. Take a quick look, make sure that this is safe to try to start. So let me get set up a little bit better and get going on this. plenty of oil. It's fine to test with, but it does need to be changed. Someone swapped this one out at one point for a Phillips. I'm not sure what all this stuff is. And no, it's not mouse poop. It almost looks like bird seed. I'm not really sure why it's there. There's no other sign of uh, a critter, but that is, that's a bit unusual. Anyway, as far as the wiring goes, things look pretty good. You know, we have these four wires coming up from the stator, two black, a white, and a green. So the black wires are the hot wires, and they come through these circuit breakers. Uh, these are 30 amps each for the missing 30 amp outlet. And the black wires come over to these 20 amp circuit breakers through these caps. And, and then these should go over to the outlets. Uh, one goes to one outlet and the other should go to the other. So let's just make sure. They actually both go over to this board here, which probably measures the load. And then we have a red and a black coming out. The black goes here and the red goes there. So that looks good. You know, the white, is connected in the right spots and the green seems to be good as well. So everything's good though. Everything's loose. So someone's definitely been in here, but I don't see anything that's going to cause a meltdown. So I'm just going to vacuum this stuff out. I am not going to repair this at this time. I do have a replacement outlet, but I don't want to, waste my time until I know it's worth my time. It's pretty dusty in here, so it's hard to get a good read on the color of the copper. But if you look at the lacing going around on the stator, 
Looks to be in good shape. None of it's broken. There's no burn marks. So I don't think this generator has had any kind of a meltdown, at least not a major one. So I think it should be safe to start. So I'm going to get the cover off the airbox. We'll try a bit of starting fluid and see what this thing will do. No signs of life. Let's get the spark tester on there. Spark plug's actually loose. And it looks like part of the boot ripped off on that plug. So I'm just going to take the plug out. We'll get that piece off and then tighten it down. Okay, we seem to have spark. So I'm just gonna put the plug back in. We'll try this again. And still we get nothing from that engine. So I'm going to get the spark plug back out. I'll just double check that the plug itself is sparking. And if it is, I'll do a compression test and see where we're at. Yeah, it's not too bad. We're at about 55 PSI, and that, that's plenty. I mean, usually I get around 60, plus or minus a few PSI. So that should definitely start. So the fact that this engine is not starting with the spark and the compression that we have, you know, I'm spraying fuel in, so what's left? Timing?
just rotating the engine clockwise until the piston's at the top, which is right there. And when the piston's at the top, the magnet on the flywheel should just be clearing the ignition coil. And it is. It's exactly where it should be. So the spark timing appears to be fine. So the fact that this isn't running, yeah, it's, uh, it's interesting. But we definitely have compression. Fuel we can cross off the list. We have spark timing. So I'm leaning more towards spark as why this thing won't ignite. Even if the timing was off or the compression was low, we'd be getting some sort of backfiring or kicking. So I don't think it's sparking under compression. So what I'm gonna do right now is just disconnect the kill wire on the coil. We'll try this again and I guess go from there. We can also try swapping out the plug and the coil itself, but that I'm most suspicious of given everything else I've seen. Spark plug's been reinstalled, and carburetor is loosely connected, mostly so I can use that choke, which is missing a screw. That's never a good sign. Hopefully it didn't end up in the engine. Pulling the wire off that coil made no difference. And it makes sense. I think that was kind of a waste of time. I know I have spark from the coil and I saw a spark on the plug, yet it's not sparking in the engine. So yeah, maybe the voltage is too low from that coil, but I think before swapping that coil out, I wanna get the plug back out, take a closer look at it, make sure that the gap on that plug is good. Yeah, that's way too much. It's about 57 thousandths of an inch. That's almost a double what it should be. And with that kind of gap, even though it was jumping the gap when I tested it, it was under one atmosphere of pressure. Once you put it under compression, it requires more voltage to jump the gap. And with a gap like that, you know, I'm guessing the coil isn't making enough voltage. So I'll bring that down to 30 thousandths and try it again. Yeah, it's better, right at 30. So let's give this a try. That's more like it. Let's try it again, this time with the light connected.
I got nothing from that light, but the engine wasn't up to speed. So I'm going to try it again. I want to see that light come on. There we go. I was starting to get worried, but the light finally did come on. So this generator is viable. I'm just gonna clean up the blower housing, the recoil, we'll get that back on the machine and then dive into the carburetor and the air box. <laughs> it's on there. It actually looks pretty good inside. So this one really won't need much to clean it up and get it to run. I think the biggest issue is that the choke is missing a screw here and it is twisted on the inside. So I'm not sure that screw can be easily replaced, but I do have this one. This came from the Yamaha clone on the engine that had been underwater. You know, that engine was a loss but I do have this carburetor, which ran the engine quite well. The only issue was the needle didn't seat well. So I'll swap the needles and give this one a go. Yeah, this one looks a lot better. So I'm just gonna use the, the, the float and the needle. 
since they both look to be in better condition. And the bowl seems to be a little better inside, so I might use this bowl as well on this carb. I forgot, this one has a broken arm, and that's what holds the float in place. So I don't want to use this one. Instead, I'm just going to remove these screws and move this whole assembly over to that carb. That one was pretty loose. And that one's not turning. So we'll give these a try. These are screw extracting pliers and they do work quite well. Hmm. All right, just put this in the vise. So this spring, I think, would have gone in there, and then the ball bearing on top of that, and there's a detent right there. When you close the choke, there's another detent right there. So, let's see if we can get the spring in. That's it. Or is it? I think that's it.
this jet here. It's the pilot jet. And on this one, it's just a press fit. There's no threads, which actually makes it kind of hard to get out. But there is a hole down the center, so I find a wood screw actually grabs that, pulls it out quite easy. So let me grab one of those. It's a big difference WD-40 made. It was coming out really slow before. I was afraid I was going to strip it, but now it just comes right out. That's pretty much it. This is the idle set. I'm going to leave that alone. This is an adjustable jet here, but it is not removable. And if you try to it'll break off. So anyway, that's all that comes off with it. I'm just gonna run through everything with a wire and probably just spray all this dust off the top before putting it in the ultrasonic. This carb's pretty clean inside. I think it would have ran. All right, it cleaned up pretty well. I wouldn't say it looks like new, but a lot of this here is just corrosion. There is still some dirt, but it's a lot better than it was. Uh, unfortunately, this bull gasket didn't make it. It may have got some carb cleaner on it, but it expanded just enough that it doesn't fit properly. So I'm gonna have to use the old one uh, from that other carburetor.
I know some of you guys already caught this, but I set the plug wrong earlier. I was aiming for 30 thousandths, and I actually set it to 35. So I have already corrected the issue. Now we're probably a little bit below 30 thousandths, but that's fine. According to Yamaha, it should be between 28 and 31. So I'm going to get this reinstalled, and then I actually want to test the strength of the coil with this. This is a tool I had ordered weeks ago for another project, and it was back-ordered. So come to find out, it actually showed up today. It was in a box next to me the whole time. So now that I know I have it, we'll put it to the test. So the way this works is you can adjust the length that the spark needs to jump and that measures essentially the voltage because you need more voltage to jump a larger gap. You know, in this case, the way I'm testing it with one side connected to the engine block for ground and the other to the coil, the instructions recommend six millimeters. So that's where I'm set at. So I'm going to pull the engine over and see if it can jump that gap. It had no issue jumping that gap. So that just gives me some reassurance that the coil is good, but I think we already knew that because regapping that spark plug brought this engine back to life. So we're getting pretty close to bringing this outside for an extended test. I think there's two things left to do here. First, these tires. These are the foam filled tires. They never go flat, but something happened to these. They are flat and it's like that on both sides. It's pretty much impossible to move around. So I'm going to throw on some new tires. And once we get this thing leveled out, get the oil changed. Anyway, you get the idea. WD-40, it works great for degreasing engines. Let's see if that carb's any good. It's a pretty cold day out, so assuming it starts and runs, I'm gonna let it warm up a bit before putting a load on it.
For something that was thrown away and has 1,500 hours on it, this thing's doing pretty good. It started first pull, engine sounds good, and the power head seems to be doing a good job as well. So overall, I don't really have too many concerns. I think the biggest one I saw was just that under a 3,000 watt load. The engine speed dropped to I think about 58 and a half, which is okay. Ideally, it would have been closer to 59. So I bumped the no load speed up just a bit more, I think to about 61.6. Repeated the test and we're hovering around 59 and a half and 60 Hertz under that load. So I think we're good. And given the amount of hours on this engine, I'm willing to bet the valves have never been checked. So I do want to get it back inside. I'll double check those valves. The carb is also running a little bit lean, so I might double check that. And then I want to dig in to this control panel, just tighten up everything that's loose and replace that missing outlet. having flashbacks. The last Yamaha MZ300 I tried to open, I ended up breaking a bolt. And I was hoping to use the impact to get all of them off, but I can't. Or can I? The valve clearance on this should be four thousandths of an inch on both valves. So that can be plus or minus a bit, but four thousandths is already pretty tight. So if it's going to be off a little bit, I'd rather have it off closer to five thousandths than three thousandths. Anyway, to check the clearance, you need to have the engine at top dead center of the compression stroke. And a lot of people don't realize this, especially if they don't do this on a regular basis. The piston. It is at top dead center twice. Once is the compression stroke and once is the exhaust stroke. And if you get it wrong, then when you set your valves, the clearance will be way off. So what I usually tell people is to just rotate the engine until one valve is all the way down, and then you can set the other valve and vice versa. It's a lot easier. You don't need to put a screwdriver on top of the piston to find top dead center. And then once you find it, are you sure you're at the right top dead center? All right, so the exhaust valve is open, so we can check the intake. And it seems to be a lot of clearance there. Let's check five thousandths. That fits. Let's check seven. Seven fits. It's probably an eight. Eight actually feels fine too. We'll try a 10. I guess regardless of what it actually is, it's, it's not right. It has to be adjusted. But for my own curiosity, I want to see how bad it was. All right, let's try a 10. does not fit so it's probably at nine thousandths right now
Okay, that's good. There's no clearance at all on the exhaust. Too tight. I think that's good. I'm just gonna rotate the engine and just double check both the valves. Four thousandths fits on the intake. Five thousandths does not. Let's check the exhausts. Four thousandths fits, five thousandths does not. So those valves, they're both set to four thousandths. That should be perfect. Just disconnecting these two leads so I have a little more slack. I made up a bunch of jumper wires to facilitate connecting this 30 amp outlet. This outlet and these wires were on that NAC, NGK generator that had the bad stator. So that is being used to bring this one fully back into operation. But before I can install it, I do have one concern. The white wire, the neutral coming up from the stator, it looks like it was cut back pretty far and I don't think it's going to reach the outlets. When it's installed, the neutral actually has to connect all the way up here, and I just don't see that happening. So I'm going to extend this wire just by a few inches and put a terminal on it so that we can get everything connected properly. Yeah, that's a mess. That's gonna have to be cut back. Oh, 
Not too proud of that one. <clears throat> Should I redo it? <laughs> Do I have enough wire? There's not a lot of wire to work with here. I'm gonna do a mechanical connection, maybe, and then flow a bit of solder or solder just as a backup, and then I'm gonna put the shrink tubing on top of it for another backup. You know, worst case, I can always run a new wire, but we'll try this first. All right, skipped ahead a bit. I just added some terminals to the ground wires. Wanted to make sure they were long enough without having to extend them. And I think, think they are, we'll be okay. So I'm just gonna connect up the neutrals and the hot wires, and this should be ready to reinstall. It took a while, but it is finally done. I've got the neutral wires reconnected. The jumper that runs from the 240 to the 120 was too short, so I had to swap that out. And leg one and leg two have been reconnected to these 30 amp fuses. And once all that was done, I still wasn't satisfied with my repair job on this neutral wire. So I ran down to the store, got some new 10 gauge stranded wire, pulled out the old and replaced it with this new wire. So now I think I'm ready to put this back together. Got everything set up and ready to go. The test tank is plumbed in. Got the kilowatt on standby and I have a breakout cord connected to the 240 volt outlet. And on each leg, I have one of these space heaters as well as the multimeter set to measure AC between leg one and leg two. If everything is wired correctly, I should see 240 volts. So let's get this thing started and see how it goes.
not too bad for a generator with 1500 hours on it this thing's doing a really good job it started right up without a load the engine was at 61 hertz 124 volts and 245 volts on the 240 outlet once loaded to 3000 watts things held just fine at 58.7 hertz and 121 volts so this generator is doing a great job so let's get this inside and finish it up And that is just about it. I mean, this thing is fairly rust free. You know, the exhaust I think is the only exception. All this stuff here, it's just discoloration and scratches and nicks, but there is no rust anywhere else on this machine. Anyway, the last thing I wanna do is replace these covers. There should be covers covering both of these outlets. Unfortunately, the one for the 240 volt outlet is discontinued but I was able to get one for the 120 volt outlet. So get that installed and call it. All right, guys, that is pretty much it. You know, this generator, I had no idea what to expect. I never do with the ones I get from the junkyard. I have no history on them. And usually they are thrown away for a good reason. You know, in this case, this engine had 1,500 hours on it. Someone definitely got their money's worth on this generator. And when it stopped running, they probably thought the worst and didn't want to pay someone to fix it. But... You know, this generator isn't done yet. You know, granted, it had a lot of maintenance things that needed to be done, but at this point, you know, I think it's in pretty good shape and should run for quite a few more hours with any luck. So I hope this video helps someone. Thanks for watching.